connected to it, so you guys will have to see it. Yeah, so. You're recording, you're on. Okay. Hi. There's Mike. Is Pat coming? What's that? Is Pat coming? Good. <laughs> Yes, she is. We'll give you a minute or so here. I, I'll uh, kind of uh, shoot the breeze here a bit. There are some of you who have never been here, and uh, that is wonderful. Uh, I've taught these classes since 1981, so uh, there. But there are still some of you that have never come to GBI classes, so I think that's wonderful. We had a huge bunch of them in the two o'clock class with Houghton. We filled this whole room. There was about 46 people here, so. Praise um, God. Uh, yeah, it's wonderful. Anyways, uh, my name, just as far as introduction, is Dave Toulson. I've been here since uh, before the Earth's crust got hard. Um, if at the very beginning of the church, I've been here since then, which is 1974. So we are celebrating our 50th anniversary. <laughs> Actually, the 17th is the actual anniversary date. That is based on the first official service we had as a church, not necessarily the incorporation of the church. So uh, uh, it had actually started some months earlier than that by a group of families. And uh, but that's the... That's how we're marking the time. The 17th of September in 1974 is the actual beginning date, first, first official service. And we met in Stevenson's funeral home in the chapel because they didn't have funerals on Sundays, typically. <laughs> but there commonly was a body in the side room, so <laughs> it was a live church, but there was some dead people there. <laughs> <laughs> Anyway, so uh, that's kind of my history. I started teaching uh, when I got out of school uh, in my undergrad degree in back in Indiana. Uh, Pastor Jerry at the time asked me to teach it. He taught alongside of me, and we were still meeting in the first very official little bitty building that's kind of been, been consumed by all of these other side additions. <laughs> and uh, we met downstairs there in the, in the little Sunday school rooms. So a lot has changed in 50 years. So welcome to class. Uh, this is the class on the doctrine of the church. We'll get into that here in a few minutes uh, as far as what all that means. But um, let's take a look in your binders to what is called page A, first page in your book. And you'll see a pumpkin picture there on the bottom of it. This is your actually re actual reading schedule. So uh, just to kind of explain to you who have never been here before, even though some of you have and are very familiar with the format of my classes, each week you will at home read some pages. And this is the schedule that shows you what those pages are, uh, when the assignments are. The only break we have in it is for Thanksgiving, clear up there almost to the very end. We meet for 12 nights, uh, 11 of them consistently, and then we take a break for Thanksgiving, and then we meet for one more. So you can see that reading schedule, which follows page A. If you look at page B, page B is the first reading assignment review questions. So then the question is, what in the world am I reading? Well, you will be reading, turn the page after B, and you will see some photocopied pages. Um, they're turned sideways in your book, so they fit well. So I need to tell you a little bit about the source of these pages. The way I do it is I'll do these weekly. I wrote the questions, but I'll do them weekly just like you are so that I'm fresh with each one each week. I just snap that first blank page out and then I read it. So let's do that. Let's snap that page out, hold it alongside, make you uh, completely familiar with what we're doing here. And I just lay it alongside there, and then I read the first article, which in this case is called Preparing for Worship. Every one of these articles is going to be churchy related, because that's the topic we're teaching in the lecture notes, the doctrine of the church. So uh, you will read 
three of these articles, and you notice on your question sheet you have six questions. They're not meant to be tricky. What they are doing is just kind of holding you accountable for them. Guilt is a phenomenal motivator. I use it frequently. So if you've got you come to class and this page is blank and you're sitting to somebody who's got it filled out, it's a good motivator. <laughs> um, so you're going to read this preparing for worship little article, and I've derived two questions out of each one of these three readings. So again, they're not tricky. So question number one is going to come out of the article called Preparing for Worship. And that question typically comes off of the first side. In other words, the first page of this little article, which in this case is page 68. Now there will sometimes be some readings in which the questions will come out of the whole article, just kind of depending on what the article's about. In other words, some questions will ask you, the article may have four or five main points in it, and the question may say, what are those four or five main points? But typically, I took one question off of page 68, a second question off of page 69, and then you turn the page and do question three off of page 68, and question four off of page 69. Now that happens to be sequential, although these photocopied articles are coming out of a little magazine. It just happened to be that they both have 68 and nines in them for the first one. So then, page, then questions number five and six will come off of page 68 and 69 in the third little article called Why We Worship on Sunday. So let's look at question number one. What three ways does Busey say are ways we can prepare to come together in worshiping on the Lord's Day. And you've got three blanks to fill. Those things are going to come off of, typically, that page 68. Okay, understandable? Mm -hmm. Not meant to be tricky at all, as far as you have to search all over creation to try to find the answers kind of a thing. That isn't the point of the questions. You do them at home in your own time, and then what happens is you come back to class and we spend the first bit of class talking about the answers. So there's a very real sense in my choice of these articles that are much more pastoral than the lecture notes, which we'll get to. They're more kind of in your face. How do I prepare to come to church? What do I do to get ready to come to church? Well, commonly, we don't really much think about it, do we? So this little article is going to confront you with things that we should have in our heads, even at home, before we drive up to the parking lot. How do I get ready to come to church? What should be in my head? What should be in my heart when I get ready to come to church? Instead of just, you know, getting up and eating breakfast and putting the right kind of clothes on and then drive to church. There's things that we should be doing spiritually. So that's that little article is going to ask you those questions. Okay? Understandable. Makes sense. Let's talk a little bit now about the source of these articles. They come out of a devotional guide that I have written for you up here on the board in red called Table Talk. It looks like this. This is the Table Talk magazine. Let's talk a little bit about how it's formatted because I want to expose you to table talk. I use this devotional guide. It's built, if you're familiar with uh, Our Daily Bread, it's familiar or similar to that as far as the way it's formatted. In other words, each day of the week there's going to be a small write-up that you read. Here's the 10th, here's the 11th. So it's calendar dated. And so you'll have, this one happens to be the month of October, I've already gotten mine. And it's going to have the 31 days of October are going to be in here in chronological order, in calendar order. Now it's formatted that Monday through Friday you have a dated article. And when you get to Saturday, Sunday, then there's a single article. Obviously formatted so that you have one reading in your home devotional guide 
that hopefully it doesn't interfere with you coming to church. So they just give you one. Now those daily articles, Monday through Friday, are thematic. We happen to be going in the last number of months here now through the book of Acts. So they're biblically related articles. They'll take a verse out of two or three paragraphs and expositorily talk about it. I'm going to pass these around and so you can kick the tires on each one of these. I have This is uh, September's, which you see my markers in it. In the front part of this book, there are additional articles varying in length and varying in number, sometimes three or four long ones, but it's usually six or eight fairly short ones, one or two pages long. And they are also thematically related to a theme that they've picked, which is listed for us on the front of each month. Uh, next month in October, the theme for those front end articles are going to be by good and necessary consequence. Now I'm hoping that you guys, through the readings of these, might begin to like them and may begin to choose to want to, or to uh, subscribe to them. They cost $30 a year for 12 issues. And you can set up a rotational, I don't subscribe anymore, I just give them my number and they just automatically send me the next year. So uh, I've done this for a, quite a number of years. I keep them all. I should say too that as you read through the photocopied pages out of here, you may see some of my markings because I've underlined stuff and all that kind of thing as I read through them. So the, uh, the articles in the October, this month that we're in, happen to be on the certainty in an uncertain world. Now, I don't know if you've noticed that the theme for this kickoff weekend have been something very similar to that, that the pastor from Forsyth was talking very much about how do we, how do we live in a world that seems to be flying apart here. So these little articles. At the end of this book, then, there are always four articles. Now, I'm by ad-libbing, I'm giving you what I've written up here on the board. And those four little articles always have titles, and they are Heart of Flame, for the church, city on a hill, and last things. And so almost all of the photocopied pages you get in your reading uh, binder are for the church. They come right out of that for the church thing. So they're always related to churchy stuff. Heart of Flame is kind of always related to motivational kind of things. And um, Sitting on a hill is kind of related to the how do we live in our culture kind of things. And then last things is just last things. It isn't necessarily prophecy kind of things. It's just kind of something they put at the last. So that's the book. I'll pass these around. You take a look at them. Um, if you do want to actually get a copy of one uh, in a week or so after having done one in your homework and looked at these today, let me know. I will call the company and we'll just order however many we might want. And then you can, you can try it for a month at home before you decide whether or not you want to spend the 30 for a 12-month subscription. Okay? So is that understandable? You're reading how to do it, where it comes from. And all that sort of thing. Yeah. So is that something you can download on your computer? Yes, it is e-formed as well, if you want to do it that way. I think the subscription rate is still the same. I, I like to write in mine. I'm kind of old-fashioned. I love the smell of cellulose and glue. <laughs> so uh, I need paper pages. Uh, e-form just seems kind of... I just It's really, really hard for me to snuggle up by the fire with a good Kindle. I you know, just it's just if tough. It something that you could... Yeah, yeah, you can. In fact, uh, I'm trying to think who all in the church actually. I know uh, Kevin Steen uses this as his devotional guide. Ken Stabler uses it, and I think both of them do it in e form. But I just like to write in mine. I like to keep them and uh, that sort of thing. So yeah, e either way is is your choice. And uh, so, any questions on the? on the reading assignments. So for next week, you can see your schedule there on page A. 
And uh, you can see the questionnaire form on page B. And you can see which three articles are listed for you at the top of page B that you're going to read and think through those six questions. All right? Make sense? I've uh, lost my little note thing here. Give me a minute. All right. Let's now turn past the uh, reading pages. And the divider in your book is green. You've got a green page somewhere up there, about 25 or 30 pages into your binder. So your reading pages, you do not have a textbook. Those of you who normally come to my class, you actually have a book by an author that we read in, and then you do the review questions. But here, it's all going to be in your binder. The green page is for those, again, of you who have never been to GBI. This is how GBI is formatted. You've heard uh, some of us from the uh, platform on Sunday mornings talking about, I think Houghton mentioned, 10 <coughs> basic beliefs within what's called systematic theology. These are the 10. And these are usually the order in which the 10 are taught, starting at the top of the green page and going to the bottom. So you can see that we, as far as schedule, this fall, are the second from the bottom. Ecclesiology, the doctrine of the church. So that means that next spring, starting sometime in January, we will teach end time stuff, which is called eschatology. And we'll wade through these ology words here, because they probably are big $9 words that you've not been exposed to much. Um, but these are the 10. So let's start at the top and let's just count the 10. Now we do a funky thing a little bit with the uh, with the chart here and that is we start counting the 10 with the little box off to the side that says the Father. So when I teach these next spring I will do the 10th one. So a year from now I will go clear back to the top of, page, of the green page and start them all over. So next fall, we will teach the doctrine of the Father, which is called theology proper. That doesn't mean that the rest of the theologies are improper. It's just that theology proper is where you talk about particularly the Godhead. So we wade through the concepts of the attributes of God, the fact that he's eternal and that he's all-knowing and all those kinds of things. And, of course, the Trinity. We wade through that concept. Now, I, I said this morning in church, if you heard me do announcements, that these classes from me are kind of for your head with some heart. Whereas Houghton's classes are kind of for your heart and a little bit of your head. So his classes are much more pastoral, the ones he just started now this morning, this afternoon. He's doing all 10 in one semester. But he's doing them like one at a time, one Sunday at a time, and really wading into, okay, now that you understand, you've got the head knowledge about what it is that God is eternal, what do we do with that? What do we as a church believe about that? And what do we do personally in our Christian walk about the fact that God never had a beginning and will never have an end. What do we do with all of that? That's how the difference is. So number one is the Father. That's uh, That will start next fall, and we'll just walk down through the tent. So number one, Father. The second one is the Son, Christology. The third one is the Spirit, Pneumatology. And you'll learn all these words in the ologies. I can define them for you now and what their origins are and where they come from. These big fancy words, where they come from. Uh, and we can do, excuse me, we can do that. The next one, then we jump over to the side, is Bibliology, the doctrine of the Bible. That one makes sense. Bibliology. Uh, biblos is the Greek word for book. And ology comes out of the uh, Greek word logos, which means a study of something or a word about something. So the bibliology is a word about the Bible. 
Now, down through the centuries, theologians have chosen to take everything that God put from Revelation 1, or excuse me, from Genesis 1 all the way through Revelation 21, and they've gathered everything that the Bible says and put them in boxes. And so everything the Bible says about God the Father has been put in this box called theology proper. Everything that the Bible says about the doctrine of angels, gathered it all the way from Genesis to Revelation, put it in a box. That's why it's called systematic theology. It systematizes it. It organizes it into categories that uh, fit these ten boxes. So if we're down to box number four, bibliology. The next one is the doctrine of angels, and you can see that we subdivide it out into pieces, but we teach it all in one class. So that's number five. So we, we know that uh, Satan was an angel, or is an angel. He didn't quit being an angel. He is still an angel. He's an angelic being, a celestial being. Uh, he's just evil now instead of good. And so we divide angelology into the good angels and the bad angels. Then we do Satanology, then we do demonology. <coughs> because uh, Satan took a bunch of the angels with him. One third of the angels fell, according to the chapters in, Ale in uh, Revelation. And uh, so we teach all of that in one class. And we just taught that one last spring. Um, we, I normally cheat on this green page, and there's a, a reason I usually do it. When I teach it in order, I tend to put angels at the bottom. And I put them there because I don't think it's terribly important that we know everything there is possibly to know about angels. Um, even though it's absolutely fascinating and people love the topic. But as far as all of the ologies are concerned, it's sort of not that important. You need to know about God. You need to know about Christ. You need to know about sin. You need to know about salvation. Angels is fun, but you don't absolutely have to know about it. But we do cover them. But I tend to put it further down in the order, but we, we did do it already last spring. The Doctrine of Man, Anthropology. And in that class, we do uh, all kinds of things like, uh, how did God make man? What does it mean that he is made in God's image? What does it mean that he has a soul? Where did that soul come from? Where did the body come from? Um, and all that sort of thing that we do that in that class. Does he have two parts or three parts? Is he made up of a body and a soul or is he made up of a body and a soul and a mind? And we wade through all of that kind of stuff. So you can see that these topics that I go through tend to be heady. Stuff in your head. Now of course it's all based on scripture but it tends to dig into things that you don't normally encounter in a Sunday school class or a midweek service class. And that, of course, was intentional from day one, clear back in 1981 when Pastor Jerry and I started these classes. It was to expose the folks, the laity of Grace Bible Church, to doctrines that we don't tend to encounter much from the pulpit. We don't tend to encounter them much in a study on our own. They're kind of heady. And we wrestle around with hard things. Erin was just talking about she's teaching junior high girls. And what did the question, what did they ask? When, when do babies get their soul? Now, is that something that you have encountered in your experience in a midweek service class or from the pulpit? <laughs> you see, those kinds of questions are coming for, even from our young people. And those are exactly the kinds of questions that we wrestle around with here in this in, in GBI. And that was that was fully the intention to expose it. Because the scripture definitely talks about it. We can have an understanding about the origin of the human soul. Where does it come from? Is there some big greenery in the sky that God just grabs a soul out of and sticks it into a body at the moment of conception? Where in the world does it come from? So we wrestle with those kinds of questions. And we do that in anthropology. Where do we get our soul? Very easy for us to understand where I got our body. That's in fact so deeply analyzed now that we can now go in in the in infant stages and tweak the genetic code. But that soul is another piece that's like, we know we have one, we sense we have one, but where in the world does it come from? 
Uh, so about two years from now, we will answer some of those questions. <laughs> so I'm baiting you a little. A worm on a hook. Uh, the next one is hamartiology, the doctrine of sin. Uh, it's one of the hardest ones to teach, but we all love to do it. We all sin very well. We are sinners by nature. Where did that sin start? How did evil come into the world? That's where we talk about that kind of thing. Who did all that? We blame it on the devil or the deep blue sea. Where did it come from? <laughs> uh, the next one is salvation, soteriology. Well, if we've got sin, we've got to fix it. And God certainly established a plan. Beginning in Genesis 3.15, he says, I've got it fixed already. I've got a plan fixed. Uh, it's called the first evangelistic piece when he tells uh, Adam and Eve that uh, there will be enmity between the, the product of the woman and the, the descendants of Satan. There will be problems, but there is a fix coming. The offspring of the woman will fix the sin problem. So we wade through that there. We are at the doctrine of the church, eschatology, and of course next spring we'll teach, or excuse me, ecclesiology, and next spring we'll teach eschatology. So do you want to know what all theologies mean? Some of them make sense. Theology proper kind of doesn't, but it's the one where we do all the uh, basic attributes of God and all that sort of thing. Christologies make sense? That word should make complete sense to us. A word about Christ. So we talk about, you know, his virgin birth. We talk about um, why did he have to be born of a virgin? Uh, is there some reason? Or was it just so that he could be so unique that everybody would notice kind of a thing? Or is there a theological reason why Christ was born, was virgin born? Um, then we do pneumatology, doctrine of the Spirit, the Holy Spirit, third person of the Trinity. Pneumatology, the word there is based on the Greek word for wind, pneuma. And we use it in our English language in scientific terms like pneumonia, a disease of the wind parts of our body, the air parts. So in scripture, the, uh, the word wind or breath was also used of the Holy Spirit. And of course, we know in the Nicodemus story, what does God, what does uh, Christ tell Nicodemus? He's like the wind. We can't see him. He comes and goes of his own uh, will. And uh, so it was very common then to utilize the word pneuma to refer to the spirit. Uh, bibliology, that one should make sense. Angiology should make sense. Hamartiology, that's two Greek words plugged together. The word is hamartia which simply means to miss the mark. That's its root form meaning. And it began to be applied to the fact that sin causes us to not measure up to the law of God, to God's standards of righteousness. We are not holy by nature. He is. So we miss the mark. Hemartia. The next one is soteriology. Soteros is the Greek word for to save. And originally it simply meant to save money or to save your cow that fell in the well. But these words began to be utilized in a more theological sense as time went by and got plugged into these boxes. Uh, ecclesiology, we'll talk about that one here in a minute. And eschatology. Eschatos simply means end or last. So it's last things. Sometimes we just call it prophecy. But it's more than prophecy. In the, in the doctrine of eschatology, we talk about uh, the intermediate state. So if you have a loved one that was a believer that has now passed away, where are they? That actually fits better in the box of eschatology. Where does your soul go? When your body goes to Stevenson's, where does your soul go? And uh, we wade through all of that stuff. So it isn't just, you know, like when is the rapture and when is the millennial kingdom and all that sort of thing. We do talk about all of that there. 
but there's some other pieces in the box of eschatology. So now you are familiar with systematic theology, theology that has been systematized. Um, we sometimes talk about in here different kinds of ways to study theology. And there are numbers of ways. One of them is called biblical theology. And that's more like what Houghton does in his class at 2 o'clock. So that's where you examine the flow of scripture. And you're not looking at all of these doctrinal boxes as a line item. You're looking at them as how they fit together. There's also historical theology, which is a study of theology down through church history. Who developed these ologies? What did the early church fathers do with Christology? How did they view Christ? And so you study the development of these ologies down through the through the, the years since the book of Acts. And uh, so there's numbers of it. We do it in this class in a systematic way. So turn to your page one, which is the next page after your green page. And you'll notice that we have some uh, blanks in the page. That's a by intention. Uh, keeps you to task. Gives you something to do with your hands while we're talking. Uh, so come with a pen. We've, of course, obviously you can pick up a pen in the room here, but be sure when you come to class that next week that you bring your binder, you bring your Bible, and you bring something to write with if you had a favorite piece to write with. So you'll be you'll be writing some stuff here in these blanks. I utilize point form for my notes. It's a form of teaching that was uh, familiar to me in my Bible studies. And so you can see those points here. And they, for those of you who are new, it might be somewhat confusing. But just think as the A levels as chapters, chapter titles. And then the B levels are subsets inside the chapters. And then the D levels, C levels, and D levels, and E levels. We'll get clear down some places where we get really into detail, where we might get clear down to uh, little A's and little B's. And, and all that sort of thing. So don't be scared of the uh, point form. It, it'll make sense. So you'll notice that the title of the first chapter is simply Introductory Matters. Things we need to visit with first as far as introduction is concerned. I don't remember how many pages we have to turn to find the next A, but somewhere over there ahead of us, uh, we will encounter another A. And it'll just be another major chapter division in our notes. Now, we will have, oh, I don't remember, is there 30, 20, 25 pages to go through? I will add some pages at the end of this as I have time to write them um, because uh, there is some other pieces. The other thing that I want to do for any of you who are new here, and that is that we chase rabbits. <laughs> so if you have questions, particularly questions that would be produced out of your reading. Don't be afraid to ask them. We chase rabbits. I may not have the answer at the time, and I'll simply tell you, I don't know right now, but let me study it a bit, and I may go home and find some pages in a book that I can photocopy to answer that question. But we definitely, so ask questions. Don't just ask questions to clarify, Dave, could you repeat what you said there? You do that, but ask questions as your brains are stimulated by this information um, and you have questions come to mind, don't be afraid to ask them. Because so, and, we, and having said that, 26 pages doesn't look like an awful lot of lecture notes for the next 12 sessions. Erin is already smiling. She's been here many, many times. We almost <laughs> never get the notes done because we do chase a lot of rabbits. Amber. Said so it was supposed to have a blue set and a yellow set, and I see that yours does, but ours doesn't. Yeah, which one's special? <laughs> <laughs> well, it says see the blue pages for the doctrinal. Oh, that's when it says that um, the blue pages are a handout that uh, is from an, another study or something you don't have yet. Okay. So where do you see that listed? for the top of it. Oh, you're way ahead of us here. Oh, 
yeah, that, that's a future handout. I do have it in the back of mine. Um, because all of these um, ologies relate distinctly to the church's doctrinal statement, you need to have a copy of the current doctrinal statement. And that's what the blue and the yellow pages. One of them, is the blue pages will be the doctrinal statement and the yellow pages are the constitution for Grace Bible Church. So uh, uh, we will read some readings in here about membership. What does it mean to be a member of a church? And of course, specifically, Grace Bible Church. Well, one of the prerequisites to membership currently, we're in the process of remodeling some of that, is that you go through with somebody like me, one of the elders, these blue pages, and you understand what this church holds as distinctives. What does Grace Bible Church believe about the Bible, bibliology? And there's a small paragraph, paragraph number one in the doctrinal statement deals with that. And uh, you need to understand, because if you're wanting to join this church, you need to be in agreement with that. Uh, if you can't be in agreement, then you need to find a church in which you are. So churches have distinctive um, groupings of understandings. So the Episcopal Church is going to have a different, different doctrinal statement than the Catholic Church that's going to have a different one that's the Grace Bible Church, and so on. So anytime you move around from city to city or whatever, and you're starting to look at churches, never be ashamed or afraid to ask them for their doctrinal statement. And then you have to, of course, understand what's in that doctrinal statement as it's listed there. And that's exactly what the GBI classes do for you. Now, obviously, because you go to Grace Bible Church and you're here tonight, the assumption is that you follow and understand what GBI or GBC, Grace Bible Church, holds as far as its core doctrines. Uh, even if you're just a mild attender and you haven't actually become a member, you're here because you must agree with something. And uh, these are the distinctives that are taught here that are the distinctives that make Grace Bible Church unique in Mile City. And we are unique in Mile City. Uh, there are definite areas in that doctrinal statement that any of the other churches here would disagree with us in various forms, whether it be charismatic elements, um, ritualistic elements, whatever they might be. That's what makes churches unique, and that's why different churches exist in different communities in, in America, particularly. Sandy. How was the doctrine formed for Grace Bible Church? Was it based off of another seven? Yes. We, we did not, per se, invent the wheel. <laughs> the reason why not is because... Well, when, when, we, when I pass out the doctrinal statement, we'll wade through some of it. And you can see that, uh, and I will actually... Uh, I will take you through the first doctor, piece of the doctrinal statement of Grace Bible Churches deals with what we believe about the Bible. Let me turn to it in my back. You don't have this, but I'll read it. And um, if I do have, yeah, here it is. Paragraph number one in Grace Bible Church's doctrinal statement is paragraph one of the scriptures. And here's a short little paragraph. We believe the Holy Scriptures of the Old and New Testaments to be the verbally inspired Word of God, the final authority for faith and life, inerrant in the original writings, infallible and God-breathed, and then a grouping of scriptures that support those things. Now, as I read that to you, my guess is that you, if you've not taken the class on bibliology, or even if you haven't maybe forgotten, you would be hard pressed for, for you to define to me what I mean when I've read that it's verbally inspired or that it's inerrant in its original form or that it's God breathed and that it's infallible. So when I pass out these blue pages for you with the doctrinal statement, I will also supply you with a six page document that I'm working on that defines 
what's in that little simple paragraph. It took six pages to, what does it mean when we say we believe? What, what does it mean to believe? Uh, so you, ha you have to understand these pieces. I would guess that most all of us who have joined Grace Bible Church that were actually on the books members probably would be hard pressed to actually wade through that piece that I just read you and define it. My guess is it's kind of out there somewhere. We don't quite understand it all. That's exactly why GBI exists, is to enable you to do that. So, long ways around to answer your question, Sandy. We, when we first started in 1974, we didn't go out on the internet because it didn't exist. <laughs> <laughs> but we began to look around and say, is there anybody that has a doctrinal statement that we can agree with, that we don't have to invent the wheel? Uh, and you will see uh, when I hand you out my notes on paragraph one, why it takes so, it would have taken years to write the doctrinal statement if we just started with zero. So we went out and we found various pieces and parts of this and we adapted them into the paragraphs that exist. Now that doctrinal statement has been amended at least twice to my knowledge since 1974. Most recently, we added, uh, the, the elder board studied it through and added a section in it that deals with gender identity. Because I can, I can tell you for a fact that in 1974, mm -hmm. gender identity would have never been thought of as being something that was even a topic of conversation. Yeah. So we had to do that. And also the area of um, homosexuality had to be addressed. And so we've added pieces into it, paragraphs into it. I don't remember the numbers on them now. I think it's 17, but I can't remember. Because we were afraid at that time, the guys on the board were afraid, that the pastoral staff would be asked to perform a same-sex marriage in the church. And of course, we didn't want that to happen, but to protect them and give them something that they could say, no, our church doesn't believe in that. Here's our doctrinal statement. And so you can see that as culture has changed and time has gone by, we've had to address different issues. Now there's things even on the horizon yet that we've got to address. Some of the wordage in the doctrinal statement of the Constitution needs to be tweaked. So you're going to get the latest form of it, but you need to know that it's even in a sense being reviewed uh, currently. That the board and some of myself, particularly with the doctrinal statement, not so much the Constitution, but different guys on the board are wading through. This has changed. We need to fix some of this wording. We need to fix some of the uh, terminology in the Constitution uh, to fit the current uh, events in, in, uh, in our culture. Okay? So, the first thing we're going to do under 1A on page number one is we're going to talk about some terms. That's the 1B level. And the 1C level is the first term that we're going to talk about, this ecclesiology. Where in the world did that word come from? Why do we use that one when we refer to the doctrine of the church? Now that's, uh, of course, our name. This is 1D, our name for this particular piece or box of systematic theology in which, put it, in which we place all the things that are relating to the church. And you can go back and look at the green page and see that's, that's that, that green box, second one from the bottom. There are things like church authority. What, what is church authority? What, what do we mean when we talk about church authority? Who has authority in the church? Is it the pastor? Is it all the pastors? Where does the buck stop as far as authority is concerned? And what we talk, when we mean when we talk about authority is that is how do we understand God's word? We have to stand on God's word as our final authority. And so we need to have elements within our church that understand this word well enough that they can help us wade through that particular issue. Like, what does scripture say about homosexuality? 
Well, that's our final authority is this word. What does it say? Uh, does it say anything? But it most assuredly does. And so that we need to have a, an authority system. Is it the elder board? Uh, and so on. So that, that's how, uh, that's in this box. We will talk about eldership in this box. Okay? Uh, your second uh, 2E, there's a blank, and that's duties. Just the word duties. What do we mean by duties? Well, it means what duties does the pastor have as opposed to the associate pastor? as opposed to the youth pastor what are the like almost like job descriptions and are they based on scripture uh do we write a job description that says that the youth pastor is in charge of the youth and we can go to hezekiah 312 but that's not in the bible by the way but it's a hypothetical book that i use for something that isn't in the bible ted because the book of hezekiah doesn't exist <laughs> sounds biblical but it's not there and can we go to some place to say, well, this is how we write a job description for a youth pastor. What elements have to be in there? Well, Scripture distinctly teaches different pieces that have to be within pastoral staff, pastor teachers. It distinctly talks about it. 1 Timothy 3, Titus chapter 1, Peter, 2 Peter 3, verse 5. So there are definitely places that we can go to to talk about duties. What are the duties of the Sunday school teacher? What kind of prerequisites do you have to have in order to teach Sunday school? Is there anything in Scripture that sets precedence for that? Or, or we just go and, you know, I've, I've been in some churches where uh, some of the music staff was actually paid individuals that didn't even go to church there. Maybe the organist went to the Methodist church, but she played the organ at the Baptist church. And that's we're talking about duties there so obviously some churches are okay with some of that and so that's part of the duties where we have to wade through these kind of things and decide how unique how uh, uh, particular do we need to be in order to prescribe duties for people that are in the church what are the duties of you that sit in the pew the laity as they're called the congregational people that sit in the pew what are your duties do you have duties some of these articles that we're going to read out of the Table Talk magazine are definitely going to talk about that. What do I do when I come to communion? What is my duty when I come to communion? How, why do I get baptized? And when do I do it? And should I do it? That's a duty and is scripturally based. So we talk about some of those same kind of things here in this section of, of ecclesiology. Forms and, and governance, organizational points. In other words, do we have a senior pastor, an associate pastor, a youth pastor, a Sunday school director? Are we, are we uh, operated by the church at large? Does everybody vote on everything from the color of the paint jobs in the, in the Sunday school rooms to what carpet we buy to who we hire, see? All, all the way from top organizational duties. Who, who does that? Are we, and we'll talk about different forms of church government congregational forms, uh, pastor-led forms, elder board-led forms, all that kind of stuff is what we'll talk about here as far as organizations. And many times, one of the distinctives that we have as a church is, is only with another church across town in how they see their organization put together. Pastor has the final say. Buck stops with him. What he says is just like God talking. So we, we, we don't do that here, by the way, but uh, we'll talk about all that kind of stuff. Rituals and ordinances. We hold to two ordinances in our church. The Catholic Church holds to multiple ones. We only hold to two, and they are baptism and communion. We don't hold marriage as an ordinance. Uh, it's certainly an institution. It's certainly scriptural, but it's not an ordinance. We don't practice remarriage once a month and we all come and change rings you know on the front of the room and say our vows all over again we don't do that um, but we certainly do that with uh, with uh, uh, communion uh, how do, why do we do it once a month instead of every Sunday why do we do it in in uh, church service and not evening service and all of that kind of stuff see that uh, that's all taught about here in this 
and we'll wade through some of that. Some of its attributes and marks, in other words, some of the distinctives, particularly in theology, that uh, churches hold that are different. And uh, 6E, even the history of the church, so your blank there is history, which we teach as a 300 level elective class. That has to be visited with a little bit so you understand how that functions. When Pastor Phil came on staff, he sought, uh, it never came to fruition, but he sought the possibility that we as a lay institute might actually become associated with, say, other evangelical lay institutes. And there are some Bible schools and Bible colleges that even look with favor on certain forms of church lay institutes as far as prerequisites to come in as a freshman into a Bible school. And so there's some advantages to that, and he was really looking into that. So what he did is he took all of the classes that Pastor Jerry and I had developed, and he actually put numbers on them. These classes, these 10, are the 100s. It takes five years with me to do the 100, the 100 levels. Then we developed a 200 level class, which takes three years, three semesters with me to finish. And in that class, we do Bible interpretation. We do observation, interpretation, and application, and it takes three semesters to get through those. So now, in the 200 levels, the assumption is you've got all the ones done. So you've got the theologies in your head, in a binder at home on a shelf, and you come to the 200s, and now we're taking pieces of text and we're analyzing them, we're exegeting them, we're looking at word order, and we're looking for things like lists, and we're looking like for things like cause and effect, and we're analyzing scripture at a verse level, clear down to a word level. And it's absolutely a blast. So uh, I would hope that there would be some of you that would eventually want to do the 200s. Then we developed, Pastor Phil and I developed 300s. In other words, just stuff that's so far off the edge there that it's, you know, really electives. And all kinds of fun things we did there, one of which was we taught church history. I did. I don't remember what all Pastor Phil taught in the 300 levels, but we went through church history from the second chapter of Acts, where the church is, brings, comes out of the ground with uh, the day of Pentecost and came all the way up to today. And it takes three semesters to do that. So we went from the apostolic age to the uh, initiation of the Reformation in 1517 with Martin Luther nailing the 95 Theses onto the church door in his hometown at Wittenberg, Germany, which started the protest protesters, the Protestant Reformation protesting against Catholicism that had held sway in, <clears throat> in Europe for uh, a thousand years. And then we went from 1517 up to about the 1700s, uh, about the time that the Puritans were in England and so on. And then we went from that time period up through American colonialism and up to the modern time period. So that in that class, uh, is where we really dig into the where in the world did the Jehovah's Witnesses come from? Where does that fit in church history? Uh, where did the Seventh-day Adventists get their start? Uh, why do we have Hutterites and Mennonites and Amish? Where, where did that all come? That's church history. And so what I'm saying in 6E there is we actually had a whole class on that. And primarily what we did is we read a textbook and then we came back to class and uh, talked about what we'd read. We'd read like you got to remember that by the time you're getting to the 300s, um, we've whittled you down to about eight people <laughs> who have the uh, fortitude because by the time we get to the 300s, we're reading 100 pages a week at home. You guys are reading six pages a week. And we understand that. Everybody starts somewhere. 
we all have a life and life does happen and so uh, it, it takes a special creature to want to do that kind of level 300 stuff but it's available it's in it's somewhere in the box at home at my house in my office and ready to come out sometime um, so just keep it in mind okay so that's kind of uh, the uh, introduction there to the box called eschatology or yeah ecclesiology excuse me and now let's talk about where did the word come from so that's 2d the words origin well it's formed of two greek words and there you can see the first one that's been transliterated for you out of the greek by transliteration i mean take the greek characters and make them english so you can read it and you can see that it's ecclesia now you can see a form of it up here. Here it is right here in English, but here's what it looks like in Greek. So we just take that word and put it into English characters, and then we plug the word logos onto the end of it. So we've got the word which means a group or an assembly, and the second word logos, which means a study about it or a word about it, and we just put the two of them together and come up with ecclesiology so that's what we're saying here under 2e formed of two greek words ecclesiology which simply means 2f assembly so originally that word in the greek language before it got to be applied to the church in the new testament in the writings of paul and so on was simply words that were used in common practice in the greek language in the first century that could simply mean an assembly to listen to a concert. It was an ecclesia. Or simply an assembly to uh, vote on something. It was an assembly. And that's all it meant to start with. So the, the uh, New Testament writers took that Greek, common Greek word in the Koine Greek language, the common Greek language, and they simply used it to talk about an assembly that meets together to worship Christ and that's the origin of the word that's how it came about so they're not words that are uh, super mysterious uh, they, they are definitely traceable and understandable once you've been exposed to them that particular word is used 114 times in the Greek New Testament now you know that the New Testament was written in the common Greek language so uh, I've got a friendly fly up here, so I'm, I'm not trying to scratch my eyebrow. Um, anyway, the common Greek language, the whole Roman Empire used the Greek language from the predecessors, the Greek culture, as their language of trade, their language of finance. Even though the Roman culture spoke Latin, they used the Greek language everybody spoke it the whole roman empire spoke greek so if you were a roman you actually were bilingual you spoke latin and greek because if you went downtown to buy potatoes you very likely needed greek but if you were a roman soldier talking to your officer you were speaking latin now there were other languages that were around at the time uh, one of which was a leftover language that was spoken mostly in Galilee, and it was called Aramaic. And it was a kind of a leftover language from the Babylonian captivity. So it, it, when you look at it, it looks like Hebrew, but it has definite differences. So Christ was at minimum trilingual. His mother tongue that he spoke with mom and dad in the carpenter shop and at home was Aramaic. And the, uh, he knew Greek because he had to go buy potatoes for mom once in a while. And he spoke Hebrew because that's what he learned in Sunday school. Well, they called it Sabbath school. That was church language. That was the old original Jewish language was Hebrew. So even the stupid fishermen like Peter and James and John were trilingual at minimum. 
and they may have even spoken some other dialects of various areas. So don't get the idea that old people a long time ago were just, you know, they were just barely crawled down out of the trees. They were still dragging their knuckles on the ground and uh, hunting women with clubs. They were vastly intelligent. And so these, these men that wrote the New Testament. Now Christ, we know it was his, his mother tongue because in deep, uh, I guess you would call it distress or trauma, he reverted to his mother tongue language. So when he's dying on the cross, he reverts to Aramaic. So when you read Eloi, Eloi, Lama Sabachthani, my God, my God, why have you forsaken me? That's Aramaic. So the, the New Testament does contain some Aramaic words, particularly region words, uh, names, and so on, sometimes would be Aramaic. So it's, it's got some things that are fairly minor, but it is there. But the vast majority of the New Testament, 99 and 9 tenths percent of it, is written in Koine Greek. Common Greek. Koine means common, K-O-I-N-E. It means common Greek because there were multiple Greek dialects. Doctors and lawyers used a different kind. There was Attic, um, I don't remember all of them, Doric, Koine, but the common Greek was the one that was spoken. Now, you have to remember that that is, now remember that scripture tells us that in the fullness of time, Christ came. Now, you and I would say, well, wouldn't it have been way better for him to wait until the internet was around <laughs> so that the gospel could be spread so much easier? But God says that in the fullness of time, in other words, in God's design, that was the right time. And we know that there are some features that were in existence in the world, the then known world, that definitely make it the right time. One of which was you had a one world government a one civilized world government. In other words, the Maya Indians were over here doing whatever they were doing, head chopping and chopping hearts out of people. Um, but as far as the civilized world was concerned, you had a one world government and it was under Roman authority. And so if you were a Roman citizen like Paul, you could travel anywhere without a visa. They didn't have visas, but they had something kind of like that. And so you had free reign. So he can go on to a missionary journey and go to Asia Minor, and he can go to Greece, and he can go to Italy, and some think that he even went clear as far as Spain, all because Rome had jurisdiction over those areas, fullness of time. In addition to that was this common language. Everybody spoke Greek. It's called in Latin, lingua franca, which means the language of finance, the language of money. And uh, it was a leftover. Isn't it odd that the Romans, when they came to power and they came, they overtook the Greeks, they retained their original language, that Greek language. And there's fascinating things about Greek that make it almost ideal for writing the New Testament in. It's very pointed. It's very easy to follow. It's got all kinds of mechanisms within that language in written form that are easy to find which pronouns have the antecedents that are correct ones, all of these kinds of things. So there's all sorts of stuff there. So that's going on. So ecclesia, you've just learned a Greek word. Okay? And we speak Greek, we don't even know it. We, we use words like this, you know. Um, we use pneumonia, pneumatic tools, um, all kinds of doctor and uh, medicine language has lots of Greek and Latin in it. And we're speaking it and we commonly don't even know it. So, used 114 times, the usage was much broader than just referring to our connection to church originally. 5F, it refer originally referred to all assemblies of any kind, whether they were religious, secular, lawful, unlawful, didn't matter. It was a word just commonly used for an assembly. Paul uses the terms more than any other New Testament writer, and probably because the majority of his writings were letters that were addressed to specific local gatherings or assemblies of believers. Now, I have cited for you, let's take a look at it, 1 Corinthians chapter 1 and verse 2, and I have cited for you on the board behind me the piece that we're going to look at from the Greek to the English. 
1 Corinthians chapter 1, verse 2. Um, somebody read that for me. Now, in class here, don't be ashamed to read. Just read loud. And also tell us what version you're using. Now, I'm hoping that we've got maybe as many as six different versions represented here in the room. In the room. So, pardon? What chapter? One. Chapter 1. Um, so I'm guessing there may be some livings, there may be some K King James, there may be some new King James, there's probably some new American standards, mm -hmm. some, some English standard mm -hmm. versions, and so on. Mm -hmm. So be yeah, sure I when you Hebrew. read, pardon? I've got Hebrew. Oh, you do? Yeah. Can you read it to us? Sure. To God's Messianic community in Corinth, consisting of those who have been set apart by Yeshua the Messiah and called to be God's holy people along with everyone everywhere who calls on the name of our Lord Yeshua the Messiah their Lord as well as ours so it's an English version but it's got Hebraisms in it yeah that's cool so where do you think the word assembly occurs in in 1 Corinthians 1 2 church the saints church. that's church does it, does it say church in your version, Deb? Mm -hmm. To the church. Oh, yeah, to the church. Yeah. Okay. Here is in the Greek, te ekklesia, or ta ekse ekklesia, to the church. The word to actually isn't in the original. It is, but it's not written. It's actually hidden in this thing right here and this thing right here. Um, it's dative. So, anyways, you have to add. That's why it's two is in parentheses up here. It's supplied. It doesn't make any sense in English for us to have read it in the original without supplying the word two. We have to do it in English, otherwise it doesn't make any sense. So, if to the church of God, to theu, there's your word theology, theu. Now, this is genitive, which is possessive, so we supply the word of, possessive, God's church. And then it goes on and says that happens to be, not doesn't happen, but is situated or is in Corinth. So there you've learned some Greek, and that's an occurrence, and you can see it written in the original up here. Epsilon, kappa, kappa, lambda, a, eta, sigma, yoda, alpha, or E-K-K-L-A-S-I-A. -K -K so I've just transliterated it from, from the Greek characters into English so that you can read it and see it. So you should see this yellow word right here and see it right back on your page one, up there in the middle where you've got it written, E-K-K-L-E-S-I-A, Ecclesia. Okay, any questions as of yet? Everybody following along? We finished one page. Look at that, Aaron. <laughs> it also occurs, of course, in 2 Corinthians. And remember that we're said, we've said here that it occurs 114 times, most of whom is being used by Paul. So let's turn over to 2 Corinthians. And here we're going to look at the first verse. I'll read it for you. I've got NASB 95. Paul, an apostle of Christ Jesus, by the will of God and Timothy, our brother, to the church of God, which is at Corinth, with all the saints who are throughout Achaia. So there's to the church again, Ecclesia. So uh, the other citations at the top of page 2, the Galatians 1, the 1 Thessalonians 1, they're all going to be the addresses on the fronts of Paul's letters to these various churches. So he names the church in the letter which you need to know, by the way, gives us the ability to give a title to that book. It did not come to the churches with the word, the book of 1 Corinthians at the top of the letter. It was a letter. And so what they read was the first verse. It's the address. Okay? Uh, so he's greeting them there, and he's using this word church, ecclesia, assembly. Uh, 7F, but look at other writers' use of the term as well and additional Pauline usage. Uh, we won't read all of Revelation 1 through 3, 
but if you remember the context in Revelation 1, 2, 3, that's the letters to the seven churches, and they're listed there as Laodicea and Thessalonica and so on, and the pros and cons for each church as, as John wrote the book of Revelation, and he's using this word, ecclesia. Um, let's look at Acts chapter 5. That's 2G in our list there. Somebody uh, catch that one and uh, shout it out. Read, tell us your version and read it for us. Acts 5.11. Okay, I have it. I have the New King James. Okay. So great fear came upon all the church and upon all who heard these things. Okay. So uh, this is the book of Acts. Who's the author? Nope. Let's go back to chapter 1, verse 1, which will give us the give us the hint. The, four, the first account that I composed, O Theophilus, about all that Jesus began to do and teach until the day when he was taken up after he had, had by the Holy Spirit given orders to the apostles whom he had chosen. So it's obviously linking to another book and we know from history that it's linked to the book the gospel of Luke so Dr. Luke wrote the book of Acts and we put that together through a number of features that are in the book of Acts because we know Luke is spoken of there later on and we enter what's called the we passages and all of a sudden he goes from, and they did this, and they did that, and all of a sudden it says, and we, so he's including himself. So Dr. Luke did travel with Paul at various times, and he is including himself there. So Dr. Luke is the author of the book of Acts, so he's using the word ecclesia, the whole church. And of course, the Acts chapter 5, what's the context there? What's going on in 5? Why did the church get scared? Have you guys got what's called pericopes in your book, in your Bible? Look at the chapter, and it might have a little chapter title, which is called a pericope. Does somebody have one? Ananias and Sapphira. Okay, Ananias and Sapphira. Um, so this is, this is the account of the husband and wife that lied to the Holy Spirit, and God killed them. And uh, so what happened, what was the result in verse 5? Scared. Got us scared. Yeah. The whole church was like, whoa! Why do you suppose Ananias and Sapphira were terminated? Well, there's several reasons, but one of them is what's in verse 5. If you had two people in your congregation who came in and spoke to the elders and fell dead at their feet and got took out and got buried in the backyard, what would be your reaction? I'm out of here. My word. Yeah. <laughs> I'm not hanging around this joint. <laughs> so it woke, it woke the church up, didn't it? it? It caused them to, we don't do that. This is wrong. Something is wrong here. So Ananias and Sapphira obviously died because they lied to the Holy Spirit about the gifting that they were supposedly giving it all, but they weren't. And uh, God killed them for it. So that's the story, that's the context that's going on here. So you can on your own then could look at some of the other passages like the uh, Acts 11 and Acts 12 and the Romans 16 and so on. So we don't always for time's sake look at every reference, but you need to know that these references are, su are supplied so that you in your own study can come back and look at them and verify. But what, you, what I want you to understand is that what we're doing in this class is based on Scripture. I don't go out and dig up some cockeyed something from Reader's Digest condensed books or whatever. It has to be scripturally based. And in addition to that, you need to check me. If these verses are not using the word ecclesia in your own study, and that's, of course, the point here under 7F, you need to check me. I am human after all, I am fallible, and uh, so I make mistakes. My typist makes mistakes. 
and sometimes I make bad interpretations, which are mistakes. So uh, you, you guys need to be, as was described in Dr. Luke's book of Acts, in which the church at Berea were commended because they checked Paul. I mean, my word, the apostle Paul gets his theology checked by a church. They were doing it. And nobody, including Mr. Paul, scolded them for it. In fact, they were commended for it. So we need to do the same. That, that should be always the case. What you hear from an internet preacher, a podcast, a website, a uh, pulpit delivery, a sermon, a GBI speaker, you need to always be checking. Check it out. So that we won't always cover all these verses, but I give them there for you. They're called proof texts. In other words, I'm using these passages to show you where Paul and other authors are using the word ecclesia. So you can go look at those other ones. So let's do 8F. The term apparently for the majority of its uses was a term referring to a local church. We'll look at local versus universal church under uh, the big C and little c somewhere down in the notes ahead of us here yet. And we'll make a distinction between big C church and little c church. But most all of the places in which ecclesia is used, it's referring to a local church. We just looked at a bunch of them. The church at Corinth, the church at Ephesus, the church at Thessalonica, and so on. Almost always used. But... There are places in which it is talking about all the churches, the church universal. So when we looked at the passage there in Acts chapter 5, when it says the whole church, where was that church at in Acts chapter 5? What church are we talking about here? Hint, this is the first book that starts to put the church together. So where did the church get first put together? <coughs> What city? Jerusalem. Yep. Jerusalem. Salem. Jerusalem. And so this is the mother church, the core church, the very first assembly, the very first church. <coughs> they haven't even started to branch out by the time we're reading chapter 5. It isn't going to occur until after we run into a Mr. Paul, and uh, then the church starts to press spread because of persecution. Um troubles make for church growth. Seems counterintuitive, but, but it does. It grows a church. Troubles grow a church. Some of your readings in the uh, Table Talk magazine, when we get out there a ways, some of the later nights or some of the later weeks that you're going to read, talk about how do you deal with trouble in a church? I mean, is it external trouble? Is it internal trouble? How do you deal with trouble? Where does conflict come from? And how do you deal with it? Does the Bible say anything about how you deal with conflict? And uh, this, some of the readings will expose you to some of that. Okay? So uh, we look forward to a time when we're going to talk about big C, little c church. Okay? 9F, because of the prefix ek, that's the first part of ekklesia uh, on the word, which is the Greek preposition. What's a preposition? Anybody remember your grammar? Preposition is a word of position, usually. That's a, like in, out, under, at, beneath, behind. Those are prepositions. So that first two letters, it's a compound word. The first two letters, E-K, ek, are actually, if they stood all by themselves, would be the Greek word for out. Okay? And from where we get our word exit, now we change the K to an X, and we make it exit go out. So the church has exit signs by code so that if we have a fire you can get out. The, the light stays on so you can read it and know which doors to get out. That word has the idea of assembly or people set aside or called out from the whole. We'll develop that concept here in a few pages. Introducing the concept here you, to you now. So let's do a little bit of wool gathering here on that. Ek means out. So how do we hook it on to lesia, ecclesia? 
Well, Scripture distinctly talks about that a church is made up of those who are called out from the rest of the population. In an ideal situation, every person in a good evangelical church should be a believer. Now, we know that's not the case. In fact, it shouldn't be the case. If we are a community-related church, we should have folks that are visiting that don't know the Lord. And they've come here looking for Him or looking for something. Maybe they don't even know what they're looking for. So as an evangelical church that is interested in evangelizing, we need to have folks that are coming that are seekers, that are looking. But the core of the church had better be those who God has called out. They have become believers. And when we study the doctrine of salvation, we talk about election, that God calls out certain people to become followers of him, to accept Christ's uh, substitutionary death. We they accept the basic tenets of the gospel, death, burial, resurrection of Christ, which was spoken of in our service this morning. And uh, they've accepted that. They've accepted Christ as their Savior. God has called them out from the rest of the population. They are believers. And the church needs to have as its core called out ones. So this ek piece on the front of the word is referring to that called out part. The second part of ekklesia is our now familiar word logos, which means a word about or a study of. And so ecclesiology is the study of a word about those who are called out to form a unique organization that we call the church. Okay? How we doing in our heads? <laughs> like just uh, <laughs> trying to get a drink out of a fire hose kind of a thing? Well, let's take a couple more gulps here and then we'll quit. <laughs> so 2C now. Next kind of a big major header. Uh, let's look back a page. and so What was 1C? Ecclesiology. So we've waded through the term ecclesiology. Now let's wade through the word church. Okay. Where in the world does that word come from? Well, this is, uh, it's a word that has an etymological connection. Oh, you want me to spell that for you? You've got a blank there. E-T-Y-M-O-L-O-G-I-C-A-L. E-T-Y-M-O-L-L-O-G-I-C-A-L. -L -L -L. Is that going one D? That... Yes. This word has an etymological connection to ecclesia. What do we mean by <laughs> etymological? You want to spell it one more time? E-T-Y-M-O-L-O-G-I-C-A-L. -E etymological. Etymological means uh, that's a word that's used to describe how words are formed, where they come from, their ancestry. That's the idea behind that word. <laughs> so even though we spell it C-H-U-R-C-H when we talk about Grace Bible Church, we don't call it Grace Bible Ecclesia, do we? But it has a root connection, an etymological connection to uh, the word Ecclesia. So now let's figure out how that etymological connection is. The idea in ecclesia and the idea in church are connected, but the word form and the change over time cannot be traced back to the New Testament uh, ecclesia. It's, it's morphed itself so many times that we've lost the easy connection. The logical connection is there. The thought connection behind the two words, church, and ecclesia are the same, but they don't even look like one another anymore, okay? So it's traced back to the Greek word kyriakos, and you can see it listed there for you, and that word means belonging to the Lord. Now, do you see the concept connection? Called out, ecclesia, kyriakos, belonging. 
if you're called out, you belong. You are now belonging to the Lord, to Christ. In fact, Scripture uses all kinds of things like this. You are now a part of me. You belong to me. You are a child of me. You are a son and daughter of me. You are in the family of God. So the logical connection now to the word church is understandable. But it has a different uh, spelling, different origin. The word which we've come, which came to be used to refer to a place where Christians met to worship. And 3E in time, it was transferred also to the people themselves as the spiritual. It wasn't just the building, now it was the people in the building as time went by. That's the whole idea behind etymology. Now, if you put an N, if it's E-N-T-O-M, what is now, what are we speaking of? Entomology, what is that? Bugs. That's the study of bugs. <laughs> so don't put the end in there. We're not bugs. <laughs> we are called out ones. Okay? So in time it came to be referred to the people themselves as the spiritual building. So our word church, C-H-U-R-C-H, actually comes from the Scottish word kirk. K-I-R-K. -K. And the German word at the top of page three, Kirch. So our word church comes from those. But we have a logical connection back to the called out ones, the ones that belong. So 5D, to conclude here, we'll go down to 3C and quit for this evening. So now church is the word that translators use to translate the word, the Greek word, ekklesia. If, if you and I start walking around the halls of Grace Bible Church and calling it Grace Bible Ecclesia, everybody's going to look at us like, where in the world, what turnip wagon did you fall off of? <laughs> um, so don't do that. But uh, at any rate, we understand it now. So you see why in this class we kind of do the head stuff. We do this word order and trace around and try to figure out where stuff comes from and why do we use those words, ancestry of words. So you can again go look at those places in, uh, in the New Testament in, in Corinthians and Galatians where that's used again. So the word behind church here is not karakos, which led to our church, but it's ecclesia assembly. I see your blank there is assembly. So we've looked at two words that are rattled around in our Christianese when we talk about church uh, and we talk about the uh, ecclesiology. Now, I realize that you guys until tonight probably never used the word ecclesiology in your common conversation in the lobby when you're picking up a donut or a muffin. Uh, but you can now, at least amongst yourselves. Uh, and you can win Bible trivia questions. <laughs> so we are going to look at several more of them starting next week. 3C, we're going to look at congregation. Where in the world did congregation come from? Because we sometimes talk about the church as being a congregation. We'll also uh, study through the word laity that you see at the bottom of page 3. What is the laity? Uh, we come to church and all lay in the pews. That's what we call us, laity. Um, so anyways... That's where we're headed. Remember your reading, um, and next week we'll talk about it. One of the things that we will for sure talk about the very first start is how did you find it? As far as reading it, was it hard? Was it easy? Uh, that sort of thing. So. I'm planning on trying to fill out the blanks, but I'm not counting on it. <laughs> well, yeah, that's the intention, Bonnie, is, is to, as you read, find the answers. But we will cover them in class. So it doesn't mean I'm not doing the reading. It's like <laughs> wide over my head. That's fine. That's fine. Just uh, give it a whirl. Yeah. And uh, so, so yeah, if you if you're, can't figure out where the answers come from, mm -hmm. we'll definitely cover them in class. I've got a question, Doug. Mm -hmm. So um, Paul wrote 
1 Corinthians, at least before Acts was written, right? Um, I don't remember. Houghton would probably be able to answer that. I can't remember sequence of order there as to which I'm books. just going off of like the introduction of the Bible book says that Acts was in 61 and 1 Corinthians was in 55. So, yes. I don't know. But, so does that mean that Paul made up the word? How would we answer that? Uh, he certainly, if that order is correct as far as historical usage of the term, he's certainly appropriating it for his for his terminology. It would be a new word to their ears. I would I'm guess. trying to think if it would be a new word. It certainly wasn't a new word in its usage as simply an assembly, but was it a new word in, in kind of in, utilized by Paul to refer to the church as an assembly? Um, I, don't, I don't know. I've not studied through that enough to know how to answer that question. You have to remember that the New Testament writers were definitely adapting words out of their culture I'm to apply sure, to things. I'm pretty sure that in Acts, uh, I can't remember the exact verse, it's the Church of Artemis, the, the gathering of Artemis. Is, uh, Which would have predated? Well, it, the point is it's, it's to uh, to juxtapose that phrase, the, the, the called out ones preposi preposition of whomever, whatever God, or it, normal construction. Uh, so that particular construction wouldn't have been abnormal okay. and out of, uh, out of the norm. Um, what would have been out of the norm is perhaps ones with Christ. Right? Yeah, or, yeah, sure. Would have been new. But, but the call out ones of the Lord, Kyrios, or whatever. whatever right. Yeah, there's many words that were peeled out of the Greek culture that are used by the New Testament writer. A perfect example is John's use of the philosophical term logos or logos in, in John chapter 1. In the beginning was the word. The original word there is logos. And that's a philosophical term. And he's, it's kind of almost a stretchy thing for John to do that because logos was, he's applying it, of course, to Christ. Logos was a philosophical understanding of uh, an, a summation of everything. Well, that's what Christ is. In the beginning was the summation of everything, Christ. And so he pulls that word out of Greek philosophy and utilizes it there. So that's a really good example of a, an adaptation by a New Testament writer. Yeah. Okay, good. We are dismissed.